I was hoping you know, uh, that some people stay outside so I can use the bell. What you what? Complain? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's a national sport. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm I'm sure it was. You know, I I. Well, any any first chapter that you read in uh, in general in Lodish are are important. Actually, we, we're skipping we're skipping a lot of uh, a lot of information and a lot of material that you would uh, later see that you uh, that you need. But you know, you just you just earn from it. Uh, the off button of this uh, projector is really located in a bad loca in a bad place, like. Uh, very easy to turn off the projector. Um, okay, so this time I want to, because I want to keep a little bit track of the of uh, which students uh, are here and uh, which students are not here in general. So we'll, <coughs> we'll do the questions in a kind of a non-stressful, okay, non-stressful uh, pop quiz uh, way, and. Uh, so also it will give you motivation to go over the questions if you're not going over them in general. Uh, so uh, Hannah, what is the what what molecular genetic uh, match like one uh, molecular uh, molecule to its role uh, to its role that it performs in the cell? Like uh, let's say we say <coughs> what type of molecule is in is in charge of decoding uh, of a nucleotide sequence? You know. Well, when when we say decoding, what do we like? We mean to uh, to to make sense of in, in a in a sense. So, if there is a and we want to uh, if we want to make sense of a nucleotide sequence, an mRNA is generally what we would refer to as creating like a copy of that information. So uh, another another try. Yes, tRNA. Right. So uh, a tRNA is the is the uh, uh, we can we can tra we can like uh, refer to this tRNA as the as a molecule that gives us meaning to the sequence, like uh, that uh, knows uh, which type of amino acid is supposed to be coupled with a triplet of uh, of nucleotides in the mRNA. Um, so it does it with the help. You mean a ribosomal? Um, yeah, but in general, this is the mediator. Okay, so the 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 whole complex obviously is in charge of translation, but but this is the molecule that does the the the, the mediation between the two. Okay. Um, okay. So, I get it. So uh, another type, like what is you have an easy one, part of the ribosome, yeah. right, and. Uh, so, Lihi, we have a Lihi here, no? Okay, great, I actually thought we didn't have, and <coughs> Gal, oh, yeah. And information transfer happens in mRNA. Uh, right, so in, so in general I, I, I could also say like that mRNA is involved in information storage, but but uh, when we think about classic, uh, classic, classic roles of, uh, of mRNA, because um, I didn't discuss that at all, but we'll talk about it when we talk about the uh, genetic mani manipulation techniques. So, uh, for example, certain types of viruses have RNA as their uh, uh, like information, or their genome is encoded in a, in a, in a form of RNA, not in a form of DNA. Um, <coughs> but it's, uh, it's like a small example. Uh, so, <coughs> Oren? Oren is here. No, all right, or it's not, because one of the problems is that I have a list, 
that is like people are registered to the course but a lot of people are not uh, coming in general so uh, stab we have stab stab here It's okay. So in general, <laughs> what type of uh, like? Actually, you have one of the one of the hardest ones. So a part of an enzyme. What would which one of these molecules are are part of what we would call an enzyme? Uh, yeah, it's in a sense it's part of it's part of an enzyme, and we have another molecule that we can from here that we can refer to it as part of an enzyme. Right. So in general, this question is here uh, to get you out of the uh, of the concept that an enzyme has to be a protein. Uh, in general, uh, the RNA or the ribosome is a pro is a <coughs> is an enzyme, and we can also uh, put inside the tRNA as like part of this uh, of this whole complex. Um, Leah. Right. And. <coughs> Uh, in the DNA molecule, so um, what, which one of these, uh, which one of these is correct, and which one will I ask? I uh, will not ask Rachelie. I'll ask you something else. Uh, no. Yeah. So, <coughs> which one of these sentences is correct in regard to DNA molecule? That a strand oriented in anti parallel, that's correct, and that D hydrogen bonds hold the two strands together. The hydrophobic effects hold the two strands together, are you sure? Um, it's, it's not actually like, it's not the hallmark of the, of the like, hydrophobic effect has effect everywhere, okay, in the cell, but I would not say that it's like the lipid bilayer or something like that, that this is actually what holds this complex. Uh, uh, this complex together. Um, so, <coughs> next question. Daniel, uh, in which molecular property do DNA and RNA differ from one another? So, the composition of bases, this is one of them. Um, is the chemical bond between the subunits different? Yeah, but for the for but for the actual bond, like when when I say like chemical bond is a subunit, I mean the backbone, uh, like the actual the the bond that keeps the backbone of the molecule together. Is the backbone bond the system that we have like this oxy uh, reboot that which which affects the pre-generation degradation? Okay, so this is resisted to degradation. And <coughs> the chemical bond between between the strands, or the type of chemical bond, is it there? Like, which type of chemical bond are is between the strands? Yeah, it's the same type of uh, chemical bond. And which one? Uh, this I didn't know how to refer this question, how to phrase this question uh, specifically. But <coughs> I was just answering that DNA is normally in the double strand structure or double strand form. Uh, almost always found in double stranded form, and RNA will be normally single stranded. Okay? So it yeah. yeah. It folds itself, but it's still not double strand. So, uh, although it forms a shape of, uh, of interaction in the territory structure, it doesn't, uh, it's not uh, considered double stranded. And uh, in regard to catalytic activity, which one of these has catalytic activity? Well, RNA can have catalytic activity. DNA, as far as we know, doesn't have like actually it can, but in general, uh, RNA has uh, catalytic activities. So, uh, yeah. So when we talked about the uh, when we talked about the structure of uh, <coughs> when we talked the structure of, of nucleic acids in general. Uh, we said that uh, in the, the difference, actually, I have it better in the first slide. The ma one of the major differences between uh, DNA and RNA uh, comes from 
an, an additional or a depleted or a deoxia, uh, uh, the, the, the absence of an oxygen in the number two position of the basic of the sugar, uh, that is the like one of the <coughs> one of the components of the of the base or the nucleic acid. So, in DNA, this oxygen here is missing, and in in the in RNA or the ribose, uh, you have <coughs> this oxygen over here, and this oxygen is one of the one of the key uh, key elements that the uh, degradation is uh, is being done through this uh, through this site. So the the absence of this uh, of this oxygen in this position makes uh, makes the DNA much much more uh, resistant uh, to degradation than RNA. In general, the structure again, what we said uh, uh, what we said before. So, uh, where is the question here? And uh, <coughs> the bonus question. Um, is for uh, um, Ben. So the one of the concepts I, again I we didn't talk so much about translation. I think that I will add if I'll, if we'll have time at the end of the year. We will talk a little bit more about translation because I feel that uh, maybe uh, this information is a little bit lacking. Um, but in general, like you saw, wh when we talked about translation, if we have the mRNA molecule, then <coughs> the ribosome, the way, the way it bounds, then it has a small unit and a large subunit. And actually, uh, the way it does it is that the small subunit, <coughs> um, with the guidance of a, of a Special, like one of the one of the tRNAs, which is a methionine, uh, which is a methionine carrying tRNA, um, is searching for a SARS codon. Okay, so it's searching for a specific uh, sequence um, along this molecule. It starts from the five prime, this is the three prime, and it scans the molecule until it finds this uh, uh, this SARS codon. And then there you have the and then you have the complete assembly and the ribosome starts moving. So how does this process stop? It stops when uh, when the ribosome reaches one of the three uh, stop codons uh, that we have. And these stop codons, what's actually special? Uh, what's special about it is that they don't have a tRNA that recognizes these codons. Okay, we d there, there doesn't exist a tRNA that identifies a uh, stop codon, a triplicate of uh, nucleic acid or, or bases uh, <coughs> that represents stop codon. So because I told you that everything here is probability and everything is kinetics, so in general what will happen, because the tRNA will not, bound, uh, will not bind, what will bind instead is a factor that we call a releasing factor uh, that will actually um <coughs> get inside of the ribosome and, caught and, cause, uh, and cause the structure of the ribosome to uh, to detach, okay, and to fall off, uh, fall off of the molecule, and uh, and the the cycle can continue uh, on and on and on. Actually, uh, the way that mRNA is translated, we'll talk about it in next chapter, is that the mRNA is a lot of times forms like this kind of loop, and the ribosome just run along it and disassemble into two components and then come together again. And uh, and vice versa, and thus you have like a lot of translation uh, of a specific mRNA molecule. Okay, so <coughs> uh, we didn't ask uh, about yet. So you're not some organism in a cell are surrounded by two membranes, and in between these membranes there is an intermediate space. Which organisms are they? And the mitochondria. <laughs> right, so we, from what you, I don't know if you remember, but in, in general, most organisms in the cells are surrounded by, and when I say like a membrane, I mean a bilayer. Okay, that's why I also added this question to emphasize the difference uh, between the two. When I, when I say two membranes, then it's two bilayers. One membrane is one bi uh, bilayer, and uh, 
all like the ER or the Golgi you have one membrane, the cell membrane has one membrane, and, but the nucleus and the mitochondria uh, have two sets of membranes uh, that assist in the in the function of this uh, organelle. Um, okay, Tomer. It's Barak or Tomer? It's Barak or Tomer? Tomer, right? Right. So, <coughs> and the last one, but I think El Bar, we don't have El Bar here, right? Lotem. Ah, Lotem, right. So it's, huh? She's not here. She's not here, right? But in general, she's here? She is here? Yeah, right. Okay. So, now we're, we'll move along like in the Freestyle, anybody can answer. I know that you're holding yourself back and not answering. So now you feel a little bit more... Ah, wait, I don't... I didn't ask... Uh, Roy? Roy? How do you... How do you refer... How do you... <laughs> no, but it's Roy like in... Uh, it's Roy is okay? Okay. So... Um, okay. So what is what what organelle is uh, responsible for this? Mit mitochondria. You mean right? So the mitochondria are like these specialized uh, small organelles that are in charge of production of all ATP in the cell um, by glucose oxidation. So they use oxygen and uh, glucose to um, to produce ATP. Um, which type of organ is, is uh, responsible for synthesis, processing, and sorting of secreted proteins? So yeah, the synthesis is like uh, indicating also the rough ER because it has ribosome that is bound uh, to it. Storage of secreted proteins, right? Secretory vesicles, and that's uh, processing and sorting of secreted proteins. Right, this is mainly the, like the post office of the cell, is the Golgi apparatus. And uh, <coughs> it's in charge of, uh, of shipping proteins uh, also like outside the cell and not only for the ex external membrane, but also proteins that are secreted. Okay, so uh, this is very important for the chapter that we're going to talk about today. Uh, integral membrane proteins are usually... so. You, we can an, we can answer this together. Um, yes. You need to say yes or no, yes, yes. and we can say, wait, I want to ring I want to ring the bell. <laughs> okay, so um, our uh, integral memory protein usually rich in alpha helixes. Yes. Oh, it's not working. Forget about it. <laughs> Are they rich in, rich in beta sheets? Who said yes? <laughs> no, because beta sheets also have uh, they have these interactions. Not all the hydrogen bonds are <coughs> are occupied, so they can interfere. They can interact with water. Uh, rich in double helix structure. Okay, this is a misleading question uh, because when we say double helix, we normally mean uh, also DNA. In general, but are entirely hydrophobic. No. Contain hydropho uh, hydrophilic region? Yes. Contain an hydrophobic region? Yes. Great. Okay, so we don't need to uh, uh, free class today. No. Okay, so, yes. The question was to integral or transmembrane? Integral. So it, defi it defines how it, de it depends how you define uh, how you define them. Some, some, uh, but most of them normally uh, are not like embedded right inside the membrane, especially like uh, at least not the proteins that we're going to discuss about. Uh, most of them like are sticking in one side. They have like they don't have to trans. Uh, they don't to have to go across the membrane. Uh, but they have normally some hydrophobic and uh, some hydrophilic uh, region. 
So, <coughs> in this chapter we're going to talk about the transport of ions and small molecules uh, that are across the cell membranes, which is obviously very important uh, for neuronal function uh, in general. So, we'll start with a short overview about what is actually membrane transport. So when we think about the, the lipid binder, like we talked about in the, in the previous class, um, this structure is actually uh, functions as, as a filter. And it can function as a filter because it, uh, it implements like two physical forces. One force is the fact, or one physical uh, uh, fact is the fact that uh, um, the core of this, uh, of this uh, long molecule, this large structure, is hydrophobic. Uh, hydrophobic. So that's why a lot of um, uh, polar or charged molecules, even if they are small, uh, will not be able to cross uh, this barrier by diffusion or by uh, <coughs> or will not be permeable to this uh, 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 to cross this membrane. Uh, but uh, and the second type of uh, a physical barrier here is that is the actual well I didn't uh, phrase it properly, but it's, it's the physical. Uh, properties like the the density uh, and the fluidity of uh, of this membrane. So if you have a membrane that's a little bit more fluid, uh, more fluid, then uh, it will allow uh, molecules to pass uh, more freely. And if it's more rigid, uh, it will allow uh, certain molecules to pass less. <coughs> uh, in a, it, they will have like more trouble. Uh, passing, passing this membrane. But in general, the fluidity and viscosity of the membrane is, is more or less constant in terms of what we talk about, uh, what we're talking about in this class. <coughs> so if we have like small gases or small uncharged uh, molecules or atoms, um, they can, uh, they're actually free, they can move freely uh, by diffusion along this, uh, along this barrier over here. And this is very important for, for example, for cell respiration. As we all know, we need oxygen, and we need to get rid of the uh, carbon dioxide. <coughs> and so these are uh, freely permeable through the membrane, as well as uh, uh, ethanol, which we all know that when we get drunk, then uh, then the effect is very is very rapid. And one of the reasons that uh, we feel it so fast is that ethanol can is uh, is highly permeable to uh, to biological membranes, so it can uh, move freely. It doesn't. It doesn't necessarily mean that this is the effect that what we are feeling when we get drunk. It's actually like something else, which we're not going to talk about. Um, but it helps it gets around uh, the body in a very, uh, very easily. Um, between the molecules that are, are impermeable to the membrane and the molecules that are permeable to the membrane, we have the molecules which are slightly permeable, and here, uh, when, we, when we discuss water, then you would expect, I always say like the membrane is highly hydrophobic, so how come uh, water can pass? Then water actually is not the most polar, or not the most, it's not charged molecule, and it's not the most polar molecule that we have. Uh, so in general, if you have, uh, <coughs> uh, if, there is, if the conditions are right, and there's enough force, let's say if the cell is, has too much in the concentration of the water, or the inside the cell is very high, uh, then uh, by diffusion or by force, uh, water molecules could, uh, could diffuse uh, outside the cell and cross, and cross this uh, uh, barrier, again, in a, very, uh, in, much less, uh, in a much less favorable um, uh, amount and way than these molecules over here. So, <coughs> Obviously, we're going to focus uh, today on ions in general, and the main ions that uh, that we're discussing in relation to the to our biological system will be uh, the potassium, <coughs> the potassium ion. Uh, sodium ion is not uh, is not is not appearing here, and chloride, also calcium, but we'll discuss it a little bit. So. If these ions cannot pass, uh, cannot uh, cannot pass freely, they have to have uh, they have to have help from special types of uh, of uh, proteins, which are uh, referred to as transfer uh, proteins. And these proteins have to be transmembranal; they have to span the membrane. And what they actually <coughs> and normally they they uh, they are 
uh, their structure is, uh, is has multiple membrane-spanning alpha helixes that are hydrophobic. And what these uh, proteins actually have to do is create like this uh, channel or this cylinder of hydrophilic environment that the molecules could pass through. Okay, so they, they will not come, it isolates the molecules it needs to pass from the hydrophobic environment uh, of the membrane itself. And uh, we refer to three types uh, of, uh, of uh, transport proteins. The first one <coughs> is an ATP powered pump, which is also the, uh, the, slowest, uh, the, the slowest transport protein. It moves about uh, 10 to 1,000 ions per second. And the fact that, the fact that we call it uh, like a pump means that it, it, does, uh, it does work, okay? And it, uh, it uses energy of the hydrolysis of ATP in order to move a uh, small molecule. In this case, uh, we're, we're looking at the, an ion, but in general, it can be many, many molecules can, uh, uh, can, can pass through the same mechanism from the uh, uh, location where you have a low concentration of these molecules to a place where you have a high concentration of these molecules. In general, if we're talking about physical forces, one of the most uh, basic uh, physical, uh, physical forces of phenomena is the phenomena of diffusion, in which if you have a, if you have a solution that has a high concentration and you, uh, <coughs> uh, and you introduce it or you put it next to a, a solution where you have a low concentration, then the molecules which, uh, from the high concentration will tend to move to the lower concentration. Okay? You can look at it as a kind of potential energy. Okay? If you have high concentration of a um, oh, actually, the, the example of water is not very good. Um, <coughs> so, in order to move against this concentration gradient, you have to you have to invest energy. Okay, so each time you'll have this movement of a molecule against this concentration gradient, it means you have to uh, you have to introduce energy to the system in order to make this happen. The second type um, of a transporter that we're going to talk about is a uh, the ion channels, and here there's an example uh, of a gated ion channel. So this, ch this ch uh, channel, once it uh, receives a, uh, or senses a signal, it can <coughs> uh, undergo a conformational change, and this conformational change uh, make it, uh, uh, makes it open. And this channel, for example, is much, much faster um, and then this channel uh, over here, because one of the reasons that it doesn't have to, uh, it doesn't have to produce, uh, it doesn't have energy uh, to to harness energy in order in order to function, because the ions are actually moving with the concentration gradient. Okay, so highly concentrated ions um, are moving to play to a location where there is low concentration of ions. So this is energ energetically favorable, and the ions are just flowing through this channel, uh, and this is also the, the fastest channel uh, that we're going to learn about with 10 to the 7 or 10 to the 8 ions per second. Uh, the, thir the third type um, of, the, of the transport protein that we're going to talk about, uh, again, is uh, <coughs> the, the most simplest uh, type is a uniporter, which is just a, a channel or a passive channel that helps, that is also specific to a certain type of molecule, and again, it doesn't need uh, energy because it, uh, and this channel is normally uh, will be will be almost uh, always open. We would refer this as non-gated, uh, a non-gated channel that doesn't undergo any conformational change or, or anything. It's just a pore uh, that's open all the time, but it's selective, and we will uh, we will learn exactly how it's selective. Yeah. Um, no, this is a, well, it depends, in, in general when we talk about uh, membrane transporters, we refer, uh, this, is the, this is the class of transmembrane proteins. There are, ah, because in, in general, in this, in this example, they refer to ion channel as like, uh, they show ion channel as gated ion channels. This can also be an ion channel, the uniporter. Uh, 
it can also be an natural, but it's like it, it doesn't undergo any conformational change. So also these ones don't undergo like massive conformational changes. So that I think that I also don't like the separations that they did in the book. We're also gonna, not going to do exactly that because these two also did like a segregation. <coughs> um, I think that because of the conformational change that undergoes here, they separated the, these two, and also because this is specifically ion, and here also there are many uh, transporters that are not specific to ions. They're specific, they're, they can be specific to glucose, they can be specific to, uh, to water, for example. So, <coughs> again, this channel, and, uh, and I now refer to it as like a passive, or a passive uh, uh, pore, doesn't require energy, because it moves uh, with the concentration gradient of, the, of that molecule, so if the molecule is highly concentrated here, it will tend to flow against the concentration gradient, uh, or with uh, the concentration gradient. And the, the last type of transporter that we're going to talk about are transporters that actually implement, that take energy or use the, the energy of the movement of one molecule that, that is moving with its concentration gradient, uh, in order to harness the energy and move another molecule against its concentration gradient. And so the red molecule here is what gives the energy for the movement of the um, black molecule. And in this type, when the two molecules are moving against each other, we'll call it an antiporter. And when, it, when they're moving together with each other, we're going to call it a symporter. But generally, it's the same mechanism. Okay, you, you take like... Uh, uh, with the use of the, of the energy or the passage of the, this molecule, you have the energy uh, to pass the second molecule against uh, <coughs> against the concentration gradient. Questions? Okay. So, the first channel that we're going to talk about, or the first transporter that we're going to talk about, is an ATP-powered pump and its effect on the intracellular ionic uh, environment. So ATP-powered pump uh, are ATP acids, first of all. ATP acids mean that they hydrolyze ATP, and they use this energy to move ions or small molecules across the cell membrane and against, and that's important, against chemical concentration gradient or electrical uh, potential or both. So did you ever hear about the, the concept of electrochemical uh, uh, potential? So you, you talked about it in, uh, in the course of the D, so it's good. But in general, you have a, I'm not going to, I put here like a, a short movie on YouTube that you can see uh, on your free time, before you want to go to bed or something like that. And uh, <coughs> that is like a short summary about the electrochemical forces if you're not uh, familiar with the topic. So uh, in general, <coughs> there are four major types of, uh, of ATP pumps, and we're mainly going to talk about P-class pump, and we're going to talk about also a little bit about V-class uh, proton pump. So P-class pump are uh, specialized uh, ATP pumps that move uh, small uh, small molecules or ions. In this case, in this uh, in this example, again against their electrochemical concentration gradient. What's funny? so uh, fun. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, all ATP-powered uh, pumps uh, have one or more binding sites of ATP, and this ATP is located in the cytosolic phase. In general, in the exoplasmatic, uh, exoplasmatic phase, you don't have like ATP flowing around, right? So if you have something like pressures that you want to keep it, then you keep it inside the cell. You don't spend it all over and secrete it. Okay, so the ATP, and also I told you that ATP molecules are highly unstable and they really tend to break into uh, the, the energy that you receive from breaking the ATP to the ATP is very high. Uh, so, and <coughs> these pumps have these binding sites uh, uh, in the intracellular or cytosolic phase uh, of the membrane. And these are the main, are the main, uh, is the main reason that we see differences in ion concentration between the extracellular part of the cell and the intracellular part of the cell. And typically when we talk about ion concentration, what you need to remember, or what is important to remember, is that potassium, uh, potassium ion is 
highly concentrated inside the cell, and the sodium ion in the sodium ion is highly concentrated concentrated outside the cell. And this is true for almost all these concentrations are actually more or less the same in all cell types in general, and specifically also in neurons. Uh, what? No, because in this example they show like uh, they're talking about an arrhythmic cell, like a blood cell or something like that. So it doesn't. Uh, but we we can refer to this as extracellular fluid in general. So also cells that are that are moving inside the bloodstream, they also have to like. So the environment of the of the blood also has these factors because it's also the extracellular fluid of these uh, these cells. But if we're if we're talking about like the CSF. Uh, of the central nervous uh, <coughs> of the central nervous system, and then these concentrations are pretty much kept. Okay, so the the proteins that are in charge of keeping this concentration are actually these pumps, and specifically when we're talking about uh, and in order to 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 maintain this concentration, the cell and especially neurons. Some some reports say that neurons spend like 60% of their energy or their chemical energy or ATP in maintaining this concentration gradient. Okay? And <coughs> we will learn uh, we will learn also why this is why the concentration gradient is, is so important and why do they invest so much energy in, in maintaining it. So the function of this uh, of this channel or the uh, the classic uh, sodium potassium ATP is <coughs> is against is again moving these two types of ions against their concentration gradient. So it moves sodium ions, uh, in, in this case, three uh, sodium ions uh, from inside the cell to the outside of the cell. And in the same, uh, in the same movement or in the same conformational change, it moves uh, two potassium ions inside the cell. So again, the two uh, the two ions are moved against their concentration gradient, and this is done <coughs> by the hydrolysis and binding of ATP. So we refer to it when uh, when the channel is in E1 state or ATP is not is not bound or not broken, then uh, this there is this cleft or the pore uh, of the channel is facing towards the cytosol and allowing the, the sodium the sodium ions to bind. And once you have binding and hydrolysis of the ATP and phosphorylation of a specific uh, side chain in this, uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this protein, then a conformational change occurs, and we move to, E2 to uh, E1 to E2 uh, conformation, and the, the channel just uh, switches the conformation, and now it's, uh, it's open to the, to the exterior part of the cell, and the sodium ions can now be released and calcium and uh, potassium potassium ions can bind, and once the potassium ions uh, have been bound, and the phosphate is, is released from the uh, is released from this protein or the channel, then the reverse conformational change occurs, and we return to the E1 state, and the uh, potassium ions are being released in the cytosol. Question? Yeah. So it's important for the function of the of the structure in general, but we're not going to get into that. Okay, like it's a, we're just not getting into like all all the components of the channel. I just want to give you like a brief. It's called like a different part because it's a different protein that's attached. It's a different yeah, it's a different subunit of the of the pump. It's a different like it it will talk maybe. I don't know if we'll talk about it. Like when big molecules are yeah. separated into parts, it means that uh, each like the alpha subunit and the beta subunit were uh, translated separately. I, I think that in in this case they're uh, they're different they're different proteins. Like in this case, um, because you have also these uh, subunits. Or I think that in this in this example or in this pump, the beta subunit is a uh, is a different protein. But sometimes there may be just a different subunit also. Well, generally, uh, like like we said, we should call it if it if it's the same part of the protein of the protein like this area, then we will call it a domain. 
and we'll not call it like a and subunit is, is is generally when we talk to for example about the uh, about the NADA receptor that it had like four different subunits that are uh, it was like a homodimer and <coughs> uh, like a that had that had four different types of uh, protein that are actually translated separately and just find each other and uh, and act as a, as the mature uh, the mature not protein but the mature uh, uh, function. Okay, so another example for <coughs> uh, for the same same type of uh, or same class of pump. Obviously, it's a different type, um, but that in charge of, of pumping calcium inside a, a, speci a special organ that is very abundant in, uh, in muscle cells that has high concentration of calcium and this is the sarcoplasmic reticulum and the, or the SR and this, this special, uh, uh, this special uh, um, how do you call it, this special organelle inside the cell is what holds calcium inside and once you have contraction of the, of the muscle then the calcium is spilled out uh, and this is what aids the, con the contraction of the, of the muscle fiber. But in general you have to have very very high concentration of calcium inside this organelle and again <coughs> we will refer to it as E1 and E2 states and once the, you have the binding of the ATP then uh, this protein transfers uh, the two calcium ions uh, across the membrane and into the SR lumen. This time the cytosol, <coughs> then this is the intracellular part, and this is uh, uh, inside an organelle of the cell. Okay? So it's not, it's not always from inside the cell to outside the cell. In this example, it's from the inside of the cell into an organelle. And in this example, it doesn't have this second protein that we, uh, that we talked about before, uh, second subunit. So <coughs> when we look actually at the molecular structure of this uh, of this calcium channel, it's actually for me it's pretty it's pretty amazing to uh, to to see the design of it that you have these uh, strands and uh, balls and the globular domains and these large uh, fibrous domains and these alpha helixes, and all you need in order to to create like a cleft uh, that in this in this uh, configuration is open. Uh, towards the cytosol, and this co configuration will be open towards the SR lumen, is the binding of, uh, of this small molecule that causes this whole structure to shift towards this direction, uh, the binding and the of ATP that causes this structure to shift in order to this direction, and this whole, and the movement of this area causes this dramatic conformation or change of the molecule and alters uh, the cleft that we see here to a conformation uh, like we see here. Okay, so it's important also in this course to see that when you see it like that in, in a sense of cartoons, it's a lot less, uh, you, you appreciate a lot less what actually, what actually happens here in the complexity of the structure. Okay, so I think now we'll talk about okay, then how we have to say here. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about so <coughs> Uh, we talked about what is the, the these ATP powered pumps are important to keep the concentration gradient uh, constant between uh, different ions and intracellular and extracellular. Now we'll talk about the non-gating non -gating ion channels or like in the, in, in the introduction when we talked about the uniporter. Uh, so this actually you can refer to this to these channels as types of types of uniporters which are passive. And the, you can look at them as the very simple pores that are through the membrane, but these very simple pores are actually specific to uh, to very very specific uh, specific uh, types of molecule, and even specific between and, and it can differentiate in a very elegant way between different types of ions also. So <coughs> these channel proteins mainly transport they can transport water or other types of iron or other, other types of hydrophilic uh, molecules um, down their concentration gradient, so this uh, process does not require uh, several energy in general. It doesn't require ATP or the assist of another uh, molecule or the energy from another molecule. And the fact that it's non-gated means that it doesn't affect, it's not affected by signaling, it's not affected by 
a binding of a molecule, and it's not affected by the memory potential, and it's not affected <coughs> uh, by a lot of factors that we're going to learn about. So, one of the questions that I will, and I know that it's, uh, I, I said that you have like specific types of uh, channels or specific types of pores for different ions. For example, one of the most important uh, transporters, and also uh, the one that is, uh, that is critical in order to keep, uh, that is also uh, highly responsible for the memory potential, for the minus 70 memory potential that you probably learned about, is this type of channel, which is a potassium channel. And <coughs> what I will leave you with in our, for, the, for the break is a question of how exactly how, when, when, I t when I talk about an ion, it's generally like an atom, okay? So it's, an, it's a small uh, sphere-like thing, okay? <laughs> that is, uh, so how, how can it be that, for example, the, the potassium ion is larger than the sodium ion? They both have uh, like this round shape. They both have positive charge. So how can this channel transfer uh, potassium ions but not sodium ions? Okay, and so like large ions we can understand. So maybe large ions just don't fit here, right? But what about smaller ions, smaller uh, positively charged ions? How can they, uh, how can they not pass through this, uh, through this channel or through this pore? Okay, and the answer will be in the next class.
Okay. So I see that you're all anxious uh, to find the answer uh, to the mystery. How can this be possible that a small molecule... What? How do you know? Ah, you... Ah, you learned it with, uh, with uh, Adi? Yes. Uh. Okay, great. So you can tell me. What happens here? Who wants to volunteer? Without the water. Ah, ah, okay. That's the sodium uh, uh, channel. So the so the uh, potassium channel actually goes through uh, with the. No, sorry, don't be awkward. <laughs> okay, so. In general, the, the idea for the selectivity comes from that the, the actual pore, or the actual, the, uh, the size of the distances of, uh, of, oxygen, of oxygen atoms that are inside the pore of this potassium channel are exactly in the right, in the right distance in order for them to bind and interact uh, with the potassium ion. And they're not in the right distance in order for them to interact fully uh, with the sodium ion. So, <coughs> in general, if we're talking about because, because the ion is passing through the, through the pore without the water molecules that are surrounding it, then the transition from this state to this state has to be like energetically favorable or at least not very energetically demanding. Okay? So, in order for the transition to happen in a, as you said, like in a smooth way, so that I, I, also, I always think about it as like, Swapping of hands. Okay, the water molecules are are uh, are giving away uh, the potassium ion, and, and for them to give uh, to give away, the potassium ion has to interact again in a in a structure that is more or less in the same energetic or in the same that is energetically favorable as this uh, structure over here that the water molecules uh, form around the potassium ion. So in, the, in, the, in this example, this structure is more stable or more energetically favorable than this structure over here, okay? because not all the oxygen uh, atoms here are interacting with the sodium, with the sodium ion over here. So <coughs> because of that reason, the transition from this state to this state is not favorable, and the transition from here to here is favorable. favorable. So. You also saw this slide? No. Okay. So, uh, in general, the passage through this uh, channel, through this pore, uh, is done <coughs> through the interaction. Here you see that this, this uh, uh, space filling, uh, space filling diagram of the only the selectivity filter uh, of this uh, of this molecule, and in each uh, each time. Uh, this uh, the ion uh, the ion the potassium ion has to interact with eight uh, eight oxygens at all times, so <coughs> the transition will not be like from uh, we will not have like four ions that are connected to the channel, but you will have each time two ions uh, that are in one and three position because in this way they have uh, and here you don't see all the all the different subunits there are two subunits one in the back and one in the front that. Uh, you're not seeing, so <coughs> that's why there's only four uh, oxygen uh, atoms that are facing here, when generally there are eight. So in order to have this eight, uh, eight oxygen confirmation, you can only have two molecules that are inside the channel at, at each given time, and these switch from one to three, one and three, and two and four. Uh, position on the channel, and once they, and from there, uh, they're released. Okay? So, you probably also learned about that, but I will repeat it anyway. How does this permeability, or how this... What? You didn't learn about this? <coughs> that what? That the two, chan two, two molecules? What do you mean? 
Okay. Maybe we're talking about different types of channels? No, it's just... Okay, it's okay. Then anything that is not clear we can talk about also later and may maybe why it's not. So, <coughs> in general, we can... Uh, the way that this channel actually is in, is, uh, in charge of the, per of, the, of the resting memory potential is, uh, again, through a, a very simple fact that if we have... Let's say we have a container and we've added ions to this container and we've added ions in a way that neutralize each other, meaning that we're adding a, a sodium chloride salt, in, in this case just table salt, NaCl, or we added a potassium chloride salt that for each ion of the potassium we have another ion, <coughs> another negative ion that cancels out this, uh, this, uh, <coughs> this positive ion. So, in general, both these solutions are electrically nu neutral. And, and also, there is no difference in electrical charge between these two solutions if you measure the, the voltage between them. This giving the fact that this membrane is impermeable for all these ions. But if we introduce a, select, uh, a specific uh, permeability, and ignore this because it's not correct, a specific permeability to potassium, then, because the potassium ion here is highly concentrated and here it's low concentrated, then the chemical gradient or the chemical force that will push it will push it towards the right side uh, of the container. And when the, when the potassium ions will start flowing to the, uh, to the right container, then because we have less ions on the left side, the, the overall charge here will be negative. Okay? So the difference between the, uh, it just, here it's just the matter of where you, where you define what you measure, but in general, <coughs> if you allow the potassium ions to flow, they will flow until, until what state, and what will cause them to stop flowing? Right, they will, le they will reach electrochemical uh, equilibrium, because the force that this, uh, this potassium ion, if it's here, it will feel, it will have two forces. One of them, one of the forces uh, will push it against the concentration gradient. The other force will push it towards the, the, chem the, the electrical attraction because it's a positive ion and this environment is negative. Okay? So when these, two, uh, when these two forces cancel each other out, we will say that it's an electrochemical equilibrium. Okay? So we probably also learned about the te different uh, batteries. She named it batteries or like chemical, no, the equilibrium point in which each ion has its own specific uh, uh, voltage in which, it, uh, in which the net of the two forces is cancelled out. How do you have Yeah. Okay, so because of the specific permeability to potassium and that the fact that in general there are much, much more um, potassium pores or potassium, uh, potassium channels or passive potassium channels uh, in the cell membrane than uh, chloride or uh, sodium, that this fact is actually one of the main contributors uh, for keeping a uh, resting potential that's minus 70, like in, uh, in most neurons. But in general, in all the cells in the body, you have negative, uh, you have negative potential. So, <coughs> Now we talked about ATP, we talked about not getting uh, uh, ion channels or pores, and <coughs> now we'll talk about the third, uh, the third type we, we didn't talk about, is a core transport that is facilitated uh, by the use of a, of a second molecule, uh, or as we, we saw in the beginning, is the molecules that are called symporters or antiporters. So, about uniporters, I'm not going to talk about because, in general, we can refer to, we can generally refer to the to the potassium channel as a, as a uniporter. Although a lot of time, these, like I told you, are referred to uh, passages of molecules, not necessarily ions. So ion channels are like this. Uh, when, when you want to say like a uniporter for an ion, you say an ion pore or an ion channel. Or a, uh, ah, another thing that's very important is that this channel. <coughs> this channel is normally called resting K channel. Okay, you also heard this uh, this term. 
So when, when, it, when you hear in an article or something like that resting K channel, it means that these are, uh, it's these channels. Okay, so <coughs> antiporters, symporters, like I said in the beginning, they couple the movement of one, of one type of molecule or one type of uh, ion uh, in order to facilitate the entrance or the movement of another type of molecule against its uh, concentration gradient. And one of the nicest examples uh, that there is in the body is how the how with the use of the different uh, activity of different uh, antiporters does the cell actually maintain a constant pH? Okay, so as you, as you all know, the cell has to keep uh, a very rigid and constant uh, intracellular uh, pH or concentration of uh, in when we talk about pH, we're talking about concentration of uh, um, hydrogen ions. So <coughs> In this case, we're going to talk about three types of antiporters, uh, the sodium hydrogen, uh, the um, sodium bicarbonate and chloride, and fluoride and bicarbonate antiporters. So, um, <coughs> when, the, when the pH of the cell uh, tends to be uh, to, towards the acidic, uh, to, towards the acidic uh, side, then the, then the activity of this specific transporter is very high. And again, this, it's a very interesting, we're not getting into that at all, but it's a very interesting mechanism, again, how these are actually pH sensors. Okay? In different pHs, they undergo different conformation on different uh, the amino acids. <coughs> on, on these proteins actually go, go over certain modifications that make them uh, more active or less active according to the pH and that there is in the cell. Okay? So if the pH is low, then this transporter becomes very active and it uses the gradient that we have in the sodium in order to pump out hydrogen ions outside of the cell. And if we have less hydrogen inside the cell, then the pH rises, the pH becomes more basic. Okay? And again, I remind you that high concentration of hydrogen ions is low pH or very acidic pH. <coughs> so and once we start getting into the range of pH that's close to the physiological pH, then we have two very interesting types of, uh, of antiporters that are actually working uh, against each other. One of them, <coughs> uh, one of them again, with use of the, of the high gradient of the sodium, introduces a, a molecule of bicarbonate and takes out a, a molecule of uh, chloride. And thus, because this, uh, because this molecule is uh, basic because it accepts uh, hydrogen ions, then it further pushes uh, the pH towards the, the basic. And, uh, and in contrast to that, we have a third type of, uh, of antiporter, which actually uh, pumps out uh, bicarbonate ions and, and pumps in, uh, I don't know why I use the, the word pump because it's not aided by ATP, uh, <coughs> but it uh, pushes out uh, bicarbonate ions and pushes in uh, chloride ions, thus making uh, the intracell uh, space or, or the fluid in the intracellular space more acidic. So, actually, did you, you didn't start the dynamic course, right? Like with Dow or something like that. So, <coughs> in general, when we have these two opposing forces that are, one of them is acting uh, more and one of them is acting less, then we will reach uh, what we call uh, this uh, stable state or a stable point or fixed point, and, depend, and depends how you refer it. And this is the intersection between these two forces. So let's say the pH is moving a little bit uh, towards this direction, then we'll have more activity of this transporter, less activity of this transporter, and the pH will start moving again towards the stable fixed point, and again, the other side. So this is actually uh, what we refer as a stable fixed point, because each perturbation to each side will be, will be uh, the system will tend to move back towards the stable point, okay? And this is done through these uh, uh, two antiporters. Question? Well, it's, it's approximately 7.2, but some cells, it, it's, a, it's in general, the, the physiological pH is around this, this region in general. You can sometimes have 7.4 or so. Um, but not less than seven, and not and normally not more than seven point four, seven point four or five. Okay. 
So, <coughs> we'll talk a little bit about aquaporins, actually really little about, it's just uh, uh, generally uh, the structure of the aqu uh, uh, aquaporin is, uh, uh, is a tetrameric structure in which each of the unit is actually a pore of its own. So in each uh, like uh, aquaporin you have uh, these four subunits that each, each one of them is a, is a channel for, uh, for water. And <coughs> uh, again, the structure is, uh, is composed of these repeating uh, alpha helical uh, formations. And now we get to the, what, one of the... What is that for? For, for getting water inside and outside of the cell. It works both ways? Yeah, both ways? yeah. It's just a pore for, for entering, for uh, uh, putting water in and out of the cell. In general, okay, this actually reminded me of a very important concept. If, let's say that the cell, in general, if we're talking about the potassium uh, channel, then it seems a little bit, uh, you know, li like a waste, because you have like, this permeability to, to an ion, and I showed you also that the pumps uh, are working very hard to keep this uh, gradient, uh, <coughs> to keep this concentration gradient between these two. So how would the cell, let's say if the cell has too much, is too permeable to, uh, to potassium, or is to uh, or uh, and now needs like to to alter this. How will this uh, mechanism be regulated? Because it's not like a uh, it's not a it's not a signal dependent. This channel doesn't undergo any conformational change. So do you have any idea how a cell can control like the permeability to potassium, for example? Yeah. Um, you're right, but this is like this will be like a severe uh, a severe manipulation, not not a very specific because because you always you will also affect other concentration of other uh, of other ions, and also the cell uh, will will uh, will not retain its shape. But this is not what I'm talking about. Is not connected to the to the aquaporin at all. Yeah. What about the ATP pump? So the ATP pump, but there, but. There's another solution which is more, you need to think about more in the, uh, like geneticist, okay? So the, the cell can actually produce more or less of that channel, okay? So the abundance of the channel can vary uh, dramatically. So if you have, if, if the cell feels that its membrane is too permeable to, to potassium, it can just silence this gene or silence the production of this protein and thus have less channels, okay? Well, not in the, not in the first, like, like, not in the minute or hour scale, but in, in actually in our scale, then it, it will have an effect. And if we're talking about, we're not talking about action potentials uh, right now, like, uh, we're talking about, like, uh, general metabolism of the cell, okay? So just, Conceptually, another level of regulation could be through the abundance uh, of these channels. So uh, the same goes to water. Uh, in this case, if there is, uh, if the permeability to water is too is too high, then uh, the cell can alter the amount, uh, can alter the amount of the uh, of the water molecules. And one of the reasons is that because I always say like ATP hydrolysis. So why would the cell want to like, get rid of its water? Because a lot of molecular processes and a lot of chemical bonds that are formed, the side product of that reaction is actually water. Okay? And a lot of times the, 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 the amount of water molecules that are produced is very high, so the cell actually needs to get rid uh, of a lot of water. And this is also why we, you have these uh, uh, aquaporins. Permeable, yeah. Most of it through aquaporins. Okay, the transition uh, through the membrane is very slow. Like now, uh, the permeability of water through a membrane is very, very slow. So, <coughs> as you probably and uh, this you saw, right? It, did Did you learn about that? Uh, did you see? It? Okay. Okay. So I'll just, okay, 
So, in general, we're talking about uh, voltage-gated channels, and we're going to focus specifically on the sodium voltage-gated channel. Uh, it has a very unique and very special structure in the way that how, how exactly will this molecule be able to sense or, uh, or measure uh, the actual voltage, or the actual voltage difference between the intracellular and the extracellular space. So, <coughs> one of the mechanisms, and there are, maybe I will give you an article about that. I don't know, I thought it was a little bit boring, but but now that you said, maybe I'll give it. Okay, <laughs> so there are many mechanisms in which, uh, in, in which proteins can actually sense voltage, and this is just one of them, okay? But in this uh, intersodium channel, uh, in general, what we have is actually um, these positively charged helixes, or positively charged alpha helixes, that are, that are positioned uh, in the center of this, uh, uh, of this structure, which actually attract and get repulsed, or uh, uh, through forces of repulsion and attraction, can move along the axis of the channel, and because of this movement, uh, they, they introduce a conformational change for the channel. So, let's say if we're in resting uh, potential, <coughs> most of the channels will be closed, because these uh, two, uh, in this example, there are actually f but there are actually four, uh, these two uh, voltage sensing uh, alpha helixes and their volt and the fact uh, and the fact that they are positively charged comes from the side chains because it, as you remember like the the special uh, formation of the alpha, alpha helix makes it uh, uh, that all the charges that are inside the backbone or, or due to the connection between the amino acids are lost between the interaction of the alpha helix itself and the properties of the alpha helix are largely determined by the side chains. So the actual side chains uh, that we normally have is every three, uh, every three or four uh, residues, you will get or a lysine or an arginine, which are positively charged, and this is why you get this uh, uh, positively charged uh, structure. So <coughs> once the membrane gets uh, depolarized, uh, these will get uh, these will get repulsed, and actually it's not like in the in the initial depolarization, it's not that the membrane is crossing to the positive side. Okay, if you learn about action potential in general, then you don't have to have a positive uh, membrane potential in order for these channels to open. It's enough to get like uh, uh, to minus 40 or something like that. And <coughs> and then once the membrane gets depolarized, there the, the exists a movement or these two uh, helical formations move upwards or are attracted now towards the accelerator part. And uh, uh, this channel undergoes a conformational change. And this conformational change opens the, opens the pore and opens the channel for entrance of sodium. Okay? And sodium, as you probably remember, is high or low in the extracellular space. What's the concentration of sodium? High. Okay? It's high outside. And not only that, normally the memory potential will be also minus. So you have two forces both of them uh, pushing the sodium ion towards the to, uh, to enter inside the cell and that you have massive and very fast entrance of sodium but uh, tough luck you, al you also have very very fast uh, mechanisms of deactivation or <coughs> uh, this global domain over here that we'll see uh, the, the model for it in a second uh, this global domain over here very rapidly moves uh, toward the, uh, after the membrane gets more and more depolarized, uh, this global domain over here moves inside the pore of the channel and actually renders it inactive. And this, one of the reasons, one of the mechanisms that actually determines the refractory period uh, of action potentials. So the time it takes uh, from this state in order for the membrane to redepolarize uh, the channel to uh, close this, uh, this global domain to exit it takes a few milliseconds. And this is, <coughs> this is also one of the reasons that the, the maximum firing frequency that neurons can, uh, can achieve is around 300 hertz. Okay? Like in general, if you're talking about the fastest neuron is 300 hertz, so it can fire an action potential. <coughs> it, it, uh, these three milliseconds uh, that pass from this state to this state are actually one of the determinants of these uh, of this frequency. Yeah. Uh, how does it get back to the original state when the global are uh, inactivated? 
creating segment with us. Again? Like this? Third, yeah, the third state and the first state. Have yeah. How does this transit from here to here? Like what, what releases the global domain? And actually also the global domain is, uh, we're not getting into that at all, but, uh, but in general the repolarization of the membrane is what releases this, uh, this cap over here. Actually, uh, you know, did you, uh, did you learn about feedback spikes or like uh, uh, hyperpolarization uh, hyper spikes? A lot of times the membranes, uh, also you need to look at the statistical models. All the membranes, in the cell, all the channels in the cell in general are in one, uh, in one, of, this, uh, in one of these conformations uh, over here. But uh, depending on the, depending on the uh, voltage of the membrane, you will have more in a different conformation. Okay, so if the membrane is highly uh, polarized, then you'll have this conformation and you have less of this conformation, okay? But a lot of time, uh, in, in many cells, you have this phenomenon that if you hyperpolarize the cell, okay? Like you, you make it, you push it very fast toward hyperpolarization, you actually release uh, a lot of the inactivation. You, uh, you release inactivation in the sense that you uh, <coughs> suddenly uh, turn all the, all the sodium channels there to be a little bit permeable, and this is actually what can cause a chain reaction that will also cause to uh, action potential, okay? Because the, because of this release of inactivation uh, of certain channels, uh, a lot of it is uh, is not because of sodium; it's also because of calcium. But uh, but in general, it's because of the release of inactivation of channels. And I have another question. Yeah. Uh, is there a sodium non-gated channel? Um, yeah, but it's much much less common. Okay, it's not. It's not in very high concentration in the cell in general. There is leakage. Uh, there are, um, I don't know, like a specific, like in general, in, in biology, the, the general answer to your question is yes. If you ask something, is there? So yes. Okay. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm not familiar with a specific type of gene that it's like the potassium pore, but there are pores that are non-specific. There are, there are like le these leakage pores uh, that some ions can pass through uh, that is not specific to, to certain types of ions. So they can leak, uh, uh, like, because you have the like chloride ion and the sodium ion also have leakage uh, through the membrane. Okay, through, the, through channels, through non-specific channels in the membrane. Okay? So <coughs> this you probably learned about. It's because of this refractory period or because of this inactivation, is what actually causes and what um, what is responsible to the phenomena that we see that the action potential moves in a unidirectional way, okay, only only towards one direction, because when the wave of the depolarization has reached this area, the the channels in the back are in refractory period or inactivated state. So although these uh, channels over here are feeling a depolarization. They're not, uh, they cannot open and they cannot enter sodium and only the channels that feel the depolarization that are over here uh, are, are active and they can, <coughs> because of depolarization, they can now open and enter sodium. So that's why the action potential uh, moves in a, specific, uh, in a specific direction. What will happen in an axon if I start the action potential from the middle of the axon? Right, it will go to both sides. There's not something, there's not like a special mechanism that makes it move only towards like uh, down, the, down the axon to the, uh, to the synaptic terminals or something like that, but this mechanism is what causes it to move uh, unidirectionally. And specifically, uh, <coughs> because uh, in a lot of a lot of our uh, a lot of the axons in the body or in a lot of types of cells, especially in the peripheral uh, nervous system, uh, we have myelin sheets that are covering the axons, and between these myelin sheets, we have this structure that is called the node of Ranvier, and specifically in this node of Ranvier, we have extremely high concentration of sodium channels, and the reason for that is for three three major reasons. First, we have <coughs> special adhesive proteins. Uh, intracellular adhesive, uh, adhesive uh, proteins, also extracellular adhesive proteins, and that that cause the the channels to cluster around this region, 
secondly, you have glial cells, certain glial cells uh, uh, secrete protein, protein hormones that are sensed only by these regions of the axon, and these cause or these trigger clustering uh, of, uh, of the channels. And <coughs> obviously, because of this structure of the myelin sh uh, sheath and this tight, uh, tight conformation that you have between the membrane, um, <coughs> between the membrane of the of the glia cells or the or the myelin and the axon, then it restricts the ability to the like I told you in the if you're looking in the membrane as a fluid mosaic model, you can have lateral diffusion in the membrane. But because of this tight myelin sheath, then the lateral diffusion of the of the receptors is restricted to the area uh, of the node. And <coughs> And in, uh, I'm not going to go in detail in, into this uh, saltatory mechanism of conduction, but in general, uh, when you have myelin, this, uh, uh, the movement of the action potential is, uh, is facilitated through these jumps uh, between the nodes of Ranvier, and in each node of Ranvier, uh, you have a new generation of full-blown action potential, and between them, you have passive conductance. And that's one of the reasons um, that myelinated axons are a lot faster than, uh, uh, than non-myelinated axons. In both of them, the, the transport is passive, or the propagation of the action potential sorry, is active. Uh, <coughs> uh, from, but the only difference is that with myelin, uh, the active part is from node to node, and actually the active part is the part that takes time. Okay? The passive conduction is actually faster, because it just requires the flow of ions in this direction, and it, just, it doesn't require like opening of channels and and uh, all this uh, milieu of reaction that requires for an action potential. So actually, I have a movie here about action potential, but I think I'm going to skip it because I think you saw. You can tell me, did you see a lot about action potential in general? Hmm. Okay, so we can look later in the presentation. Or maybe you want a break. Okay. So. <laughs> we all need to watch TV every once in a while. Action potentials propagate in a continuous fashion in unmyelinated axons. Okay. Once an action potential is generated in the initial segment of the axon, it propagates the entire length of the axon. Recall that a threshold stimulus causes voltage-gated sodium channels to open. The influx of sodium ions generates an action potential. It also establishes a depolarizing current that flows to the next segment and brings it to threshold. Voltage-gated sodium channels open, regenerating the action potential in this segment of the axon. Current flows from this segment and depolarizes the next segment to threshold, thus regenerating the action potential yet again. In this way, regeneration continues in one direction all the way down to the axon terminals. The basis for unidirectional propagation is revealed when we take a closer look. By the end of the depolarization phase of the action potential, all voltage-gated sodium channels inactivate and voltage-gated potassium channels open. These two events render this segment of the axon temporarily insensitive or refractory to another depolarizing stimulus. However, voltage-gated sodium channels in the downstream segment are closed and receptive to a depolarizing stimulus. Thus, propagation occurs sequentially down the axon to the axon terminals. In myelinated axons, action potential propagation is a bit different. Here they propagate in a saltatory or leaping fashion. The myelin sheath consists of multiple layers of tightly wrapped glial cell membrane. But this sheath is not a continuous one. Exposed areas of axonal membrane, known as nodes of... You don't see it here, but this is actually these are actually cells. Okay, these are like uh, Schwann cells, and normally these are found in the peripheral nervous system, in the central nervous system. Rambier occur at discrete intervals. 
Voltage gated sodium channels are abundant in the nodes, but largely absent between nodes. So, action potentials are regenerated at each node, not in areas covered by the myelin sheath. However, the myelin sheath does provide the insulation necessary for the rapid spread of depolarizing current. And the sooner the nodes reach threshold, the faster action potentials propagate along the axon. Saltatory conduction is extremely fast. Velocities often exceed 100 meters per second. In contrast, continuous conduction is fairly slow. Velocities rarely exceed 2 meters per second. Nevertheless, both continuous and saltatory conduction propagate action potentials over varying distances because action potentials regenerate along the way. Summary Propagation of an action potential Once generated, the action potential propagates the entire length of the axon without decrement. Okay. Um, you mean in a lot of times the nerve cells in the that sense uh, the C fiber that sense pain, for example, are non myelinated, and this is also why they're slower. Uh, so that's why you're also, uh, it takes you time also to sense pain, and this is kind of this is one of the uh, <coughs> like the nicest uh, example you can think of because a lot of time like and also it makes sense uh, in a sense because you don't want to every small uh, every small uh, a lot of time it makes sense to that the pain will arrive a little bit later than the than the sensor than the sensory feeling. Um, <coughs> okay. Where am I? <coughs> and these are specifically for, uh, there are different types of, uh, you can also feel pain from a myelinated axon, but the pain is like different. There are also levels of pain. Okay, and and uh, one, like the C fibers are for the highest degree of, uh, of pain. So, um, Alright, here. Okay. okay. So now we have a, like a better understanding of how come, why, why does the cell actually introduce so much energy in uh, in keeping this uh, concentration gradient? Because actually, the concentration gradient is energy. Okay, and if you think about it, where do you have where do you have like a make uh, a system that is similar that you're dependent on daily for uh, more and more during the, during your days or during your life. So let's think about the battery of your cell phone, okay? For example, <laughs> so in the battery of a cell phone, you have potential energy in the form of different, like in here, it's separation of charge, but it's more or less, uh, but it's more or less the same concept. And you're dependent, you're very much dependent on the separation of these charges. And when you don't have any separation of the charges, then your phone actually it dies. So you have, <coughs> so the energy of the, of for the action potential is actually then the fact that um, action potentials can happen thousands of times in nerve cell without any, a single molecule of ATP that will, uh, will be needed is because of this, uh, uh, that this concentration gradient is actually kept uh, between this, uh <coughs> between the extracellular and the intracellular part of the cell. This is actually, um, one of the, especially for neurons, but other cells use it for other functions as well, okay? Typically, there are 10 voltage-gated uh, sodium channels per square micrometer of plasma membrane, if we're talking about the general plasma membrane. And <coughs> if we're talking specifically about the axon HELOC, where most action potentials are generated, then we have from 100 to 200 for every square uh, uh, micrometer. And in Northern Rivia, we have more than 1,000. So they're very, very highly concentrated uh, in these uh, segments. So each channel can pass <coughs> about 5,000 to 10,000 ions during the less of a millisecond that it's open. And overall, 
more than two million, um, two million sodium and two million uh, uh, potassium ions enter and leave the cell during uh, an action potential. So the question is, is this a lot? Okay, like is two million, uh, is two million molecules that enter a cell each time in each action potential? Is it a lot? Does it affect the concentration gradient? Does it alter the, the concentration of the of the ions? Because I said we we introduced two million molecules, and you can have thousand action potentials, um, or not. In a second, you can have like uh, hundreds of action potentials, and you have two million uh, two million ions that are entering the cell. So could this alter the uh, the balance between the concentration gradients? What's that? Well, no, <laughs> and really a little, okay, so, and really a little, actually the number of, uh, of sodium ions, the difference in concentration that is caused inside the cell is about 0.05% of the total concentration. So you need 20 in order to change like 1%, okay, and again, and again, and again, specifically, I also, I also, this is the number of sodium ions that you have inside the cell. So inside the cell, it's, it's a relatively small volume, so it's easy to change the concentration, the relative concentration of the ions. In the extracellular domain, there's no way, okay? But, well, again, in the cell itself, that's, that's one of the reasons that you have so much, um, in, in, when we're talking about long, uh, over long time or large uh, time scales, like s multiple seconds or minutes, then you already have the sodium potassium pumps that help uh, to introduce this gradient. But it's not a major challenge. If, if it was like 50% of the, of the ionic content, then you will lose the, the gradient and you will not be able to, uh, to produce new action potentials. So, <coughs> Uh, as well as the, this is a, like, uh, a way to, to show in a spread out way this uh, sodium channel, the same sodium channel that we saw before, which is composed, and now we will call this four domains because it's actually the same molecule, okay? So the same molecule that has these four domains that are uh, just repeated and with small variations uh, between these domains <coughs> are very similar to what you will find in the voltage-gated potassium channel, that in the case of the potassium channel, we will call this subunit. Okay, so this is important to uh, to state the difference in the nomenclature, and <coughs> specifically the, these areas, the area, uh, the the helix five and six, and the connecting uh, and the connecting segments between them, are actually uh, homologous to generally non-gating the channel, like the channel that we saw for the pore or the resting, uh, resting K channel uh, that just transfers the potassium. So <coughs> from here you get the selectivity, from here you get the sensing, and here this is a very well-conserved domain, and you can also see that it uh, repeats itself very well in multiple types of channels and multiple types of, uh, of, uh <coughs> of pores. Okay, so all, generally, when we're talking about uh, voltage-gated ion channels, all of them need to be sensitive to memory potential. They need to open a channel in order for them to introduce uh, ions, and they need to be inactivated shortly uh, after the opening. Because if they're not inactivated, then uh, <coughs> normally we're going to lose the, the effect or we're not going to be able to regenerate a new, uh, a new opening of the channel. So. In the nice example of the, uh, of the potassium channel, and with that we're going to finish, uh, there's a nice experiment that also is described in the book that's uh, done by uh, Zagota et al. in 1990. And what they actually did, and this is, if this is the structure of the potassium channel, again, it's composed of four different subunits, okay? <coughs> and uh, it has also these four uh, global domains that act as the, this gate or inactivation gate. And what they did is they actually um, they expressed this channel, uh, one time the wild type channel or the, or the normal channel, the second time they expressed, they expressed a mutant channel that didn't have 
these green uh, segments. So that it, it lost the ability to, uh, to perform an activation. <coughs> and, that, and what they saw is when, when they depolarized the, uh, the membrane, uh, that opposed to the wild type, which is what we see here, the channel did not become inactivated and uh, the current of the potassium just kept flowing outside. Okay? And <coughs> when they added a synthetic peptide that they produced uh, in order to mimic the structure of this, uh, uh, of this part of the protein, they actually rescued uh, this function. And a lot of time in, uh, in elegant biological experiments, you want to show not only that you ruin a function, because you have a lot of ways to ruin a function, you have to, you, if you want to reclaim or uh, strengthen your claim, you have to show that you rescued, uh, you can rescue this function as well. And thus, you show that you really understand uh, the mechanism of action. Okay, so, right. Okay, just a last point, okay, is that, <coughs> like I said before, everything is about probability, okay? So, um, it's not that if you're uh, in depolarized state, all the channels are closed, all the channels are open, all the channels are deactivated or, or non-deactivated or in refractory state. It's actually a, it's actually a matter of statistics. And <coughs> if we take under, uh, for example, uh, the potassium channel, so these are like patch clamp recordings that are, um, and what they did is that they altered the memory potential. And <coughs> what they actually saw is that when you uh, depolarize the membrane, or make the uh, membrane, it's actually not depolarized, but it, you make the membrane potential more positive, then you have higher probability of the, of the opening of the channel. And not only that, but you have higher currents, which is uh, depicted by the height uh, of the flow of the, or the effect of the opening of the channel, um, because you alter the, you, you further the ion, from its uh, reversal potential, okay? So once the ion is further from the reversal potential, then more force is pushing it in and thus allowing faster uh, flow through the channel. So you have more current if, you're, uh, if the membrane is more uh, positive. So it's a matter of statistic, time it stays open and iron current, in, in iron, iron current. Okay, so in general there are like a hundred different types of voltage-gated voltage uh, potassium channels in vertebrates, and each one of them is different and exhibits a different voltage dependency, conductances, and kinetics. So next time we just have uh, the last part, and then we're going to move uh, to G-protein coupled receptors. And I think maybe I will send. I'm uh, still thinking about it, about sending you an article that you have to read for next time. I'm still thinking about which type of article. Maybe I'll give you two and you have to decide between them. And uh, we'll see. את יכולה לראות תמיד את ההרצאות של ההקלטות. כן, את רשומה במודל? אז יש במודל, שמתי בפוסט בהתחלה, את הלינק.